Tonight, I want to look with you at one of my favorite passages that really is just an invitation to listen to God, an invitation to read his word and know what is true. And knowing what is true is important. When, uh, when I was a kid, our, our family had a book called The Song of the King. And it was the story of a prince who invited three brave knights to his father's castle, his father being the king. And one of these knights was known for being the strongest, another for being the swiftest, and one for being the wisest. But this brought little hope to these three knights because their journey to the castle would take them through a dark and dangerous forest that was known to entrap and destroy any who passed through it. The prince explained that each knight would be able able to choose a companion for the journey and that the king would help them find their way through the dark forest. He would do so by playing a song on his flute each day. Three times a day he would play it, and the prince played this song for them so that they too could know the song of the king, know what to listen for. Follow the song, and you will get safely to the castle, the prince promised. So the knights all chose their companions and set out. And after many days, the knight, being known for being wise, limped into the castle with his companion. The people of the kingdom were eager to hear of how his journey went. And the knight told them of how the creatures in this forest would play their own flutes to drown out the song of the king. Different songs, different sounds from every corner of the forest. It was hard to know which song was the right one and to follow that. It was almost impossible to hear the sound or the song of the king amidst all the other songs. Finally, someone asked the question that was on everyone's mind, well, how did you make it then? To which the knight replied, I chose the right companion. And sure enough, he had picked the prince, who knew the song of the king and could help the knight perceive the true song from all the counterfeits. Now, like all allegories, children's stories, they they break down if you press them too far. But I think the main point of this story is true and hits home. You need to know God. You need to know his son and know them so well that you can avoid the many heresies and false hopes that plague this world in our hearts. When we look out on this world, it can be hard to identify what's true. There are so many voices. If you're on social media, you see them, you read them. If you read the news or watch the news, you hear them there. Uh, If you have conversation with family and friends, you hear so many different ideals, different opinions. So many strategies for curing the ills of the world. So many political hopes and fears. These voices and opinions and ideals can be scary and confusing. When they are voiced by our family or friends or acquaintances or enemies. But I think false hopes are the scariest when they grow up in our own hearts as they do. Our hearts are false hope factories. So many things that we can trust in, that we think about, that we can trust in, that are just not the hope that God has given to us. When, when we showed up in Papua New Guinea, people were hoping in other things, hoping in traditions, hoping in spirits, hoping in certain incantations to make it from this life to the next. Some of these hopes to us sound foreign and unfamiliar, but, but we do the same thing. We put our hopes in politicians or in hoping that our freedoms will last, or hoping that we'll have certain rights. So many different things to hope and so many things that when those hopes start to slip, maybe it's our finances get out of control, we start to fear. We lose our grip on what's true. Last week, during equipping hour, I mentioned that one conviction that 
keeps me hopeful as a translator is that God is the author of the Bible. This conviction keeps me hopeful as a missionary. This conviction keeps me hopeful as a believer. God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. He never lies, and he has a book with real truth in it. How can we know it's true? Everyone wants to make it to heaven. No one wants to be lost forever. We all want to make it. So how can we know where we're going? How can we know how to make it? And with stakes this high, we don't want to settle for our own opinion or our own truth or our best guess. What we need, what we want is real, actual truth that really will help us in the end. When I taught the Doe people of Papua New Guinea the chronological story of the Bible from cover to cover, I did not start in Genesis. Genesis 1-1 was lesson number two. Lesson number one was 2 Peter chapter one. Because I wanted the Doe people, before we even started studying the Bible, I wanted them to know what the Bible actually is. My hope is that they would hear these words and know where to turn to when the days are dark and the competing voices are many. And I want the same for us. So, if you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1, this is near the end of your Bibles. There's 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, Jude, and then Revelation. So this is right there at the end. And Peter is writing this at the end of his life. He is about to be led out of his prison cell and executed by the Roman government. Some of you will recall that Jesus told Peter that he would die in this way. He told Peter that he would be led where he did not want to go. And sure enough, we have... Uh, extra-biblical historical sources that record Peter's death by crucifixion under the Roman emperor Nero. And before he was executed, he wrote this letter. And these are his final words. These are the truths that he wanted his readers to remember after he had died. He knows the dangers that believers are going to face in this world. In chapter 2, verse 1, Peter says that false prophets arose in the past among the people, and false teachers will arise among you. To those that he's writing, he knows there's going to be false teachers. There are going to be myths. There's going to be clever thinking. There's going to be heresies that are going to come in. False teachers are going to arise. They're going to bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them. And they will bring upon themselves swift destruction. And not just upon them, the false prophets, but listen, verse 2 of chapter 2. And many will follow their sensuality. And because of them, the way of truth will be blasphemed. Those are the dangers that we want to avoid. Those are the dangers Peter wants his readers to avoid. And to equip them, he makes every effort to remind them of the truth that they need to know. In 2 Peter 1.11, Peter writes, For in this way there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So Peter knows that there is a way to get to heaven. There is a way. Therefore, he says, I intend always to remind you of these things. Though you know them and are established in the truth that you have. And, and then skip down to verse 15. I will make every effort so that after my departure, you may be able at any time to recall these things. There is a way to be saved. There is a way to make it to heaven. There are things that we need to know. And Peter is writing to help his readers recall these things. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to read 
2 Peter chapter 1 in its entirety, and this is going to be kind of a flyover. We're going to look at the entire chapter and just follow Peter's logic uh, through these verses. There are many details in there that we're not going to look at, many stones that we're not going to turn over. All of them are worth looking at and turning over at some point. But for today, we're going to just look at this whole chapter. What are these things that Peter wants his readers to remember? And what is the way that richly provides us with entrance into Jesus' eternal kingdom? What is it? That's what we're going to look at. So let's start by looking at the first four verses of 2 Peter chapter 1. Follow along with me as I read. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desires. So Peter starts by making sure that his readers know who wrote the letter and to whom the letter was written. The author is Simon Peter, He introduces himself as slave and apostle of Jesus Christ. So he identifies him first and foremost as a slave of Jesus Christ. A slave, one who listens to and obeys the Lord Jesus. He is under the authority of Jesus. Jesus is his boss. He listens to Jesus and obeys him. And tied to that for Peter is this idea of apostleship. He is a slave and apostle of Jesus Christ. He's an apostle. That means he was physically with Jesus. He witnessed his ministry here on earth. And then he was saved by Jesus and sent out by Jesus to serve Jesus in a unique way. To serve him as an authoritative witness of this promised Messiah. That's who's writing. The audience is those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. He's writing to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing. This is not to say, what Peter's not saying here, is that he thinks that some Christians have faith like an apostle. And then there's other Christians who have more of a mediocre faith, And then there's some who barely have any faith, some who are backslidden, and you know that there's different levels of faith. That is not what Peter is saying. He is saying, if you are a believer, then you have faith like an apostle. He is saying that if you are a believer, you have received your faith from, here's what he says, the righteousness of, of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's that's the same way Peter got saved. Was through the righteousness of his Savior, not through his own. So if you have faith in the Lord Jesus, your faith is the same as Peter's. Peter had to trust the Lord Jesus for salvation, and so do you. Our faith is in the same person. And so our standing before God is equal. Jesus' righteousness does not change from believer to believer. It is bestowed on the believer equally. All of us need the same righteousness. And if you trust in the Lord Jesus, you get that righteousness. The same. Whether you're Peter or whether you're from Tempe, Arizona, sitting in a pew. After Peter makes clear who's writing and to whom he is writing, he starts his letter. And he jumps right in 
with his hope for his audience. Verse 2, may grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. So Peter wants those who believe in Jesus to have grace and peace in abundance. Grace and peace in abundance. More grace and more peace than what they already have. Now, as you read 2 Peter chapter 1, you should ask the same question that I had to ask as I translated this verse into dough, and that is this. What are grace and peace? Do you know what they are? Because Peter wants his readers to have more of those things. And it's really important every now and then to slow down and think about the terms that we use in Christianity, the terms that we use in church. Grace is a common one. I mean, we sing it in our songs, right? Grace and peace, so how can this be? That songs of great, let songs of gratefulness ever rise, never cease, right? We sing about grace. We have grace written on the front of our building. Do you know what it is? Grace is often defined as undeserved favor. Undeserved favor. So let's unpack that definition a little bit. Undeserved. Undeserved favor. That undeserved part points to something lacking in the one to whom grace is shown. It's undeserved, which means if you get grace, you don't deserve it, which means there's a problem with you. Before I left for the mission field, I taught ancient history to a bunch of middle schoolers. And I told them that if you look back at those who came before us, if you look at the history of the ancient world, there are really just two things you need to realize. Two truths that are really clear by studying the ancient world. And those are these. You are evil and you are going to die. Everyone is evil. Everyone dies. When you look at the ancient world, that's, that's what you see. And all, all my students would be like, Mr. Can, your class is so depressing. But, but that is what it was. I mean, why do they have these giant castles and moats and weapons? It's to protect themselves from other people who want to take their stuff. And they're not innocent. They're building armies themselves to go after and take other people's things. Everybody's evil. And everyone dies. There's not a single person that we studied in the ancient world who's still alive today. None of them. Ramses the Great of Egypt. He lived to the age of 90-some, 90 92, I think, in a day and age when people barely made it to 40. So people thought he was going to live forever, but he died. And he is very dead. His body tours the world in this glass box where you can see his mummified body. Ramses is gone. Everybody dies. And everyone is evil. Everyone looks after themselves, and given enough time, nobody lasts. All of history shows us that we too, like them, must find a solution to our wickedness and our mortality. We are undeserving. We are frail. The next word in Grace's definition is favor, undeserved favor. God is rich in mercy, rich in favor, abounding in loving kindness. And if you've opened your Bibles, you know that there is a solution to both the problems that I've mentioned. And both those, that solution can be found in God. God has provided help for those who are sick with sin and rapidly approaching death. There is help to be found. The way we've defined grace in dough, I've taken this term grace. I'm like, how do I say this? So far, our working definition of grace is free help. God helps you even when you do not deserve it. It's a gift. Grace is when God gives you the help you need to be free from evil and to truly live and not perish forever. That is grace. It's help you don't deserve. So knowing what grace is is really helpful. 
when Peter is asking, God, may grace and peace be multiplied to my readers. Grace is undeserved help. Peter wants his readers to have more of it. To know their unworthiness and to know that there actually is help. You are evil and you are going to die and God has help for you. The next word is peace. May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of our Lord Jesus. We can understand that peace is the opposite of war and hostility. But what many do not realize is that the peace that Peter has in mind is between God and man. What many do not realize is that God is opposed to the proud. God hates evil, and that is bad news for everyone who is evil. The Bible clearly teaches that apart from Jesus Christ, all will perish and not have eternal life. Children of wrath, Paul wrote. So when you die, you don't just lose your life, you lose everything. If you do not have peace with God, you lose all comfort, all hope, all joy, all light, all rest, everything that is good, all tenderness, all pleasantness, all of it, all of it gone. Why? No peace with God. He is against you. You are his enemy. When we see that reality, peace with God sounds wonderful. And here Peter is right at the beginning. May grace and this kind of peace be multiplied to you. So how are they going to get it? How are his readers, how is his audience going to get this grace and peace? There is only one source. He says it's in the knowledge of God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace go hand in hand with knowing God, truly knowing him. We need to know the Lord. We need to know his terrifying power. We need to know his amazing grace, amazing grace. So the next question is, well, then how can we know about God? How do we get this help that we need? And that takes us to verse 3. Verse 3 actually starts in the Greek with a, a little comparative word, kind of like the English word like or as. The ESV, if you have ESV like me, it doesn't translate this word. There's just a period at the end of verse 2, and then verse 3 starts a new sentence. Uh, if you have the NASB, it translates it this way, seeing that. His divine power has granted us something. There's a Bible translation for uh, translators called the Net Bible, and I think they catch the idea best when they translate it this way. They translate it, uh, P- uh, Peter is praying, I can pray for you to have more grace and more peace because his divine power has bestowed on us everything necessary for life and godliness. I think because is the right translation there. Peter is giving the basis, a foundation for a hope, for for his hope and plea that believers would have multiplied grace and peace. And the foundation of that hope is this. Jesus has divine power. And his divine power has given us everything that pertains to life and godliness. Did you catch it? Everything that pertains to life and godliness. Those are the two things that you and I need. Everybody's evil and everybody dies. That's the bad news. After I, I, I preached a, a version of this sermon to, to the youth, and afterwards people were explaining it to Josh Kelso, and they, oh, Zach was telling us how everyone's evil and everyone dies. And Josh went, oh no, did he stop there? No. Neither does, neither does Peter. Peter does not stop there. Everybody's evil and everyone dies and the divine power of Jesus Christ has everything you need for life and godliness. Life for your mortality and godliness for your immorality. Jesus has everything that you need. Do 
Jesus, the Messiah, provides these things to anyone who believes him, trusts him. And he does it through the knowledge talked about in verse 2. The knowledge of him who called you to his own glory and excellence. So this is the second time knowledge is showing up. You need to know God. You need to know this solution to your problem. You need to know the one who called you to his own glory and excellence. Listen, Jesus has glory and excellence that we need. Jesus has the glory of God. He is the light of God. He is Yahweh, the Son of God. You need him. Jesus has stainless virtue. He has excellence. He does everything right, which is totally in contrast to us who do everything wrong. We are evil. And here Jesus is calling us to his own glory and excellence. It is through these or by these that he has given to us his precious and very great promises. Verse 4. The scriptures are full of wonderful promises. And this chapter, like I said in the beginning, is an invitation to read the Bible and discover those promises. Those promises can be found from Genesis onward. If you need a place to start, start in Romans 8 with the promise that there is nothing that can separate you from the love of God. Nothing. Not even death. And Jesus did all this. He granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Gave us knowledge. Granted, us preci- uh, granted to us his precious and very great promises for a reason. He has a goal in mind. And his goal, as stated here, is that you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. If you are in Christ, if you believe him, you've escaped from the corruption that is in the world. That is the vanity, the hopelessness, the meaninglessness that is in this world. In Christ, you escape it. And now, and it's so that you may become more like God. That's the goal of Jesus calling you to his own glory and excellence, that you would look more like God, that you would become partakers of his divine nature. And this is where Peter's going to go next in this chapter. First, he's reminding them that they have everything they need for life and godliness because of all that Jesus has done. He has provided the life, the godliness, the glory, the excellence, the promises. And now Peter is going to remind his audience of the aim of the believer. What the believer should be aiming at. So the logic goes something like this. Because God has given you everything you need for life and godliness, because he has equipped you with his promises, for this reason, live godly lives. Let's read it. Starting in verse 5, we'll read down through verse 11. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. For in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, A lot of people, myself included, struggle with this question at some point Am I saved? Am I saved? And what God gives us here through the pen of Peter is a goal 
an aim by which we can test ourselves. If you are one who trusts in Jesus, then regardless of your age, whether you're a kid, parent, grandparent, God has given you everything you need. Therefore, for this reason, supplement your faith. That is, supply it, furnish it, support it, add to it. Make every effort to do so. Put your whole self into this endeavor. And so he gives a list for this reason. You've received everything from Jesus. Everything you need for life and godliness. So, for this reason, make every effort to supplement your faith. And then he goes through a list. With virtue. Striving to do what is good, what is right. And add to that knowledge. Seeking to know what is true. To know what is right and good and beautiful. And to knowledge, supply self-control. So once you know, try to apply what you know. Say no to yourself. Read God's word and obey it. All right, self-control, it's just the ability to say no to our desires. And bolster that self-control with steadfastness. Perseverance, the ability to keep going. And as you go, grow in steadfastness, add to that godliness. And to godliness, brotherly affection. And supply your brotherly affection with love. I mean, the picture here is a pursuit of holiness. That holiness without which no one will see the Lord. It's taking every aspect of our hearts and our minds and our energies and making every effort to supply our faith with these virtues. It's the aim of a believer. We've been saved. God has given us everything we need for life and godliness, and so we pursue godliness. We want to be more like him. We want to partake of his divine nature. And then Peter gives what is, that's the logic. And then Peter gives what is kind of a test for believers to take. It's almost as if Peter is saying, God wants you to be godly. He has given you power for godliness. So, check to see if this power is yours or not. To see if you have this divine power. If you pursue these qualities and you find that they are yours and increasing, you're pursuing knowledge, pursuing godliness, pursuing self-control, pursuing steadfastness, persevering, loving the brethren, loving God, Pursuing those things, if you're pursuing those things, they will keep you from being ineffective and unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And if there is no fruit, if there's no fruit, if you do not see those things growing and increasing, then there can be no confidence that Jesus' divine power has given you anything pertaining to godliness. Perhaps, like Peter says, you've forgotten God's forgiveness. Maybe you're struggling to have self-control, struggling to love. Wasn't it Jesus who said, he, is, he who is forgiven little loves little? In other words, if you care little for the virtues on this list, if you don't care to grow in virtue, or to grow in knowledge, or self-control, or steadfastness, or godliness, or brotherly affection, or love, if you don't care for that list, if those things aren't important to you, if you look at your life and they don't even begin to define you, well then what hope do you have that you are forgiven? Perhaps you're not. This is a big deal. These are eternal matters and they matter for you so peter says therefore be diligent to confirm your calling and election check to see if you are saved if you try to pursue these qualities and you find that you are relying on your own strength and your own resources to live the christian life maybe you're creating your own traditions like the pharisees were putting on 
godliness as a front when their hearts were wicked. Saying, look at all the rules I'm following, but really their heart was desiring other things. You need to look out. If you try to pursue godliness in that way, you'll fail. You won't be able to. When I told the, when I preached this to the, the villagers, I, I told them, I'm like, just try to be self-controlled. Just try. Try to say no to yourself. Try to live a godly life. Apart from Christ, you won't be able to. You just won't. You won't love those things. You won't want to pursue those things. But perhaps in trying to do that, you'll come to the realization, I need help. And that leads you right back to the start of the letter, grace. Free help. It's there. Do you need help to be godly? It's there. Go to Christ. He can provide you with the help that you need. And if these qualities are yours, if the Lord permits you to reach repentance and to submit to him, he'll give you the power needed for godliness. His divine power, his magnificent promises will grant you the strength you need to have self-control. And to do so again and again and again. And as you do, he will give you grace to love the brothers with all their failings, your brothers and sisters in Christ, to love them, to love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, to love your neighbor as yourself. And if these qualities are yours and increasing, this ought not to lead you to think, wow, I'm such a good person. No, they should lead you to think, I'm saved. I'm saved. I have God, so I have what I need in Christ for life and godliness. That's the point. This is a test. Are you trusting in God or not? This is so important that it's literally the last thing Peter writes about before he dies. And we already looked at this, verses 12 to 15. Therefore, I intend always to remind you of these qualities. This, this eternal life, entrance into the eternal kingdom of Jesus is at stake. Therefore, I'm trying to remind you of these things. Even though you already, maybe you already know them. Though you know them and are established in them, in, in the truth that you have, believer, I think it right as long as I am in the body to stir you up by way of reminder, since I know the putting off of my body will be soon, as the Lord Jesus Christ made clear to me. And I will make every effort so that after my departure, you may be able at any time to recall these things. Peter wants his readers to have life and godliness, more grace, more peace, to have true solutions to their greatest problems. Peter here is convinced he has the right answer. He's about to die, and he's putting all of his trust in the power and hope of Jesus Christ. Why? Why this solution, Peter? And that is what I want to look at finally. This is the last thing that Peter writes about in this part of the letter. In chapter 1, he writes about the supremacy of God's word. Peter wants his readers to recall the certainty of God's word. So let's read it. This is verses 16 through the end. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, the voice was born to him by the majestic glory. This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed, to which you would do well to pay attention. As to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God 
as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So this is Peter. He's just told them, I want you to be able to recall these things. And I'm going to make every effort to make sure you can recall these things. One of those efforts of Peter's is writing this letter. He's writing this letter so that we can be reminded of what is actually true. And he wants us to know that this letter is authoritative. This letter is sure. This letter will help you get to the end. In the midst of all the other voices, all the other ideas that are out there, this letter, this word is true. God's word is true, and it is a faithful witness to who God is and how to get to him. All the things that Peter has said about how Jesus is the the source his divine power has, the life and the godliness that you need, his desire that we have more grace, more peace, that we have undeserved favor, free help. The fact that we have all these, Peter wants us to know we're not standing on shaky ground here. This is not one hope among many. He says, for we do, did not follow cleverly devised myths when we were talking to you, when we made known to you about the power of Jesus Christ, that power for life and godliness and his coming again, his winning in the end. When we wrote about those things, we were not following cleverly devised myths. We weren't following the false hopes of this world. We weren't becoming ourselves false teachers and giving you false hope. Contrasted to that, we have real hope, solid hope, real truth. He contrasts it with two things. One is being an eyewitness. That's what helps make this sure for Peter. The other is the prophetic word. Peter has hope in both of these things because they both come from God. Look at the first one. We were eyewitnesses of his majesty. And actually, that word there is is passive. We were made eyewitnesses of his majesty. When he, that's Jesus, received glory and honor from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Peter says, we ourselves heard this voice, for we were with him. On the holy mountain, Jesus brought them up and God revealed to them who Jesus is. And the transfiguration showed them. You want to see a glimpse of Jesus' glory, his divine power? Here it is. And Peter was made an eyewitness. And the apostles have something else. They have a prophetic word. He's like, not only do I have my eyewitness, I was there, I saw it, this is true. And, verse 19, we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed. The apostles were prophets speaking from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And this word they preached, this word they wrote down in gospels, historical accounts, the letters, This word is true, it's certain, it's confirmed. This word has the seal of God's approval. It is, in fact, God's word. It's his. Therefore, it's trustworthy and reliable. And Peter here points out something. It is more fully confirmed. It's more sure, more reliable. Well, more reliable than what? And there's, there's some debate on this word, and we don't have time to get into all of it. Some translations say that the prophetic word is more fully confirmed. Some say the prophetic word is made more fully confirmed. And so people debate, is is uh, Peter's eyewitness making the word more sure? Or is the word more sure than Peter's eyewitness account? Uh, Which one is it? Uh, I don't think it's either. I think Peter is saying, listen, this word that I'm preaching you, it's true. One, I'm an eyewitness to it. And number two, this is a prophetic word, and it's more fully confirmed. More fully confirmed than what? I think he's contrasting this to, in verse 16, the cleverly devised myths, or verse, or chapter 2, verse 1. I mean, look what's coming. False prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. In a world where there are many voices, many songs to listen to, 
right? Many different voices to follow, opinions, beliefs, lies that rise up even in our own hearts. In a world like that, you need a more fully confirmed word. You need a word that's more sure than that. And here it is. It's God's word. It is more reliable than any sweet promise the world might give you. It's more reliable than any offers that free you up to do whatever you want. Give in to your desires. Don't say no to them. Don't have self-control. Give in. Be free. Live however you want. You only live once. You do you. Live your truth, whatever the expression of the day might be. There are a lot of offers in this world to do whatever you want. Those are all clever myths. They are tempting lies, but do not give in to them. Those lies are not reliable. Look at what Peter says in 2 Peter 2, 18 to 19. For speaking loud boasts of folly, they entice by sensual passions of the flesh those who are barely escaping from those who live in error. They promise them freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption. So speaking, this is the false teachers, speaking they entice. They're going to give you permission. Do whatever you want. It's going to be fine. And they're promising things to you, but they are enslaved. Peter says, don't listen to them. They are lying to you. Those clever myths will destroy you. So who should you listen to? In verse 19, he says, we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed that we there is, the, is still the apostles. It's the apostles that have the prophetic word. They were given the word. We have the prophetic word more fully confirmed to which you, audience, You readers will do well to pay attention to as to a lamp shining in a dark place. We must pay attention to this word handed down to us. And if we pay attention to it, we do well. I mean, don't we want to do well in this life? Don't we want to do well? Don't we want to make it through this life? Be welcomed into the kingdom of God? Well, then you must pay attention to this word. You do well to pay attention to it. There's nowhere else that you could go to find the words of eternal life. If you neglect this word, or abandon this word, or tamper with this word, or negotiate with this word, you will lose your life. Things will not go well with you, either in this life or the next. And here's how to pay attention to it. How to pay attention to it. As to a lamp shining in a dark place. How helpful light is in the dark. Have you ever been camping and realized how helpful it is to have a flashlight? Light helps you find your way. Light helps you get things done. Light helps you get your bearings. Light helps you look out for dangers. How dreadful darkness is with no light. Pay attention to this word as if your life and happiness depended on it. It's a dark world out there, and this word is a lamp. Pay attention to this word until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. That's for how long should we pay attention to this word. How long? Well, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. This is just another great example of a phrase where after you read it, you go, what in the world does that mean? Until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. I think that means pay attention to this word until you see the Lord Jesus face to face. Either at your death or at his second coming. Where are you going to go when you have to figure out and navigate this life? Are you going to look to your own interpretation of things? Are you going to follow the wisdom of others? We need to know, verse 20, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. It doesn't come from someone's own interpretation. People do not have the right to interpret the Bible however they want. 
to make sense of it however they want. They need to read and understand what God has clearly said. Verse 21, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man. Man is not the source of your Bibles. Peter's making that point. We didn't follow cleverly devised myths. We were made eyewitnesses. God did something. He revealed something to us on a mountain. And we have this prophetic word. This was given to us. God gave them this word. Men spoke from God. End of verse 21. Men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. This is not a word of man. This is a word of God. Lots of people out there are going to tell you how to make sense of the world. When you need hope, there will be people to point you to political hopes, financial ones. When you feel guilty because of sin, you can find people who will tell you that it's not your fault. When you're scared of death, there will be people who will tell you that it's all going to be okay in the end. Oh, you're fine. You're a good person. Like the snake in the garden, they'll boldly say, you surely won't die. That's the first lie in the Bible. A lie that God won't punish sin. When he clearly said, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat it. For in the day that you eat it, you will surely die. Satan goes, you won't die. You're going to be fine. Trust me. And it's a lie. Satan's the father of creating cleverly devised myths. He's the father of lies, and there are a lot of lies out there. We need to recall true things in this world. And this is where we go to find them. So again, this is an invitation. It's a plea to read your Bibles. It's an invitation to come to God's word and learn what is actually true about God, about you, and how to have the help that you need that you do not deserve. How to have peace with God. This is why I started here when I taught before teaching the story of the Bible with all its promises, we need to read the Bible. It is certain, and you can find sure hope here. So let's pay attention to this word, okay? Let's pay attention to it until we either die or until Jesus returns. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word and that it's true. Oh God, there are many voices in this world And we need to make sure that we are following you and no one else. God, I need to make sure that as I teach people, whether in the States or in Papua New Guinea, that I am just pointing them to the authority. God, no authority rests with me. Nothing is true because I say it is. God, all authority rests with you. All hope rests with you. Truth is only to be found in you. And God, you have given us a book. Thank you. God, I pray that we would take it up and read. And that as we read, we would recall to mind these things. That you are the source of salvation. That you give everything we need for life and godliness. Godliness for our wickedness, our evil. Life for our mortality. God, we we long to make it to the kingdom. We long for entrance. An entrance richly provided to us into an eternal kingdom, a kingdom that will never end. God, that's what we want. I pray you would lead us there. God, may you show us the truth in your word and not just show us, may we know it and believe it and trust it. And then may we, may we obey you. God, give us your power to live a godly life. God, help us to have self-control. Help us to persevere. Help us to be steadfast. Help us to love our brothers and sisters in Christ. God, help us to love our neighbors. Help us to love you. God, we can ask these things knowing that your word promises that there is help to be had. So help us, I pray. Amen.